This program is brought to you in part by Westinghouse Electric Corporation and its over 100,000 employees worldwide, dedicated to quality and excellence. Hello, I'm Michael Field, station manager of WQEX-TV. In 1970, I came to Pittsburgh to produce a television show called Contact. And that was when I first met Marie Torrey and a grade schooler named Roma, her daughter. Time passed and uh, I moved on to other challenges. Marie eventually left KDKA and little girls grew up. But tonight, here we are, back in Pittsburgh, together again. And it occurs to me that there may be some of you out there who don't know much about Marie. And with the exception of some Mount Lebanon High School graduates, class of 1976, much about Roma either. So we've assembled what you might call video profiles of them both. So before you meet Vin Sarni, Tito Capobianco, Mike Kalina, and Patty Burns, let's take a few moments to re-meet Marie and Roma Torre. By my serving this 10-day term, uh, it contributes to, to any kind of legislation protecting newspaper sources, and it will all have been worthwhile. After you serve your 10-day term, and if you're again ordered into court and told to reveal your source, what do you intend to do? Well, I'll worry about that when I get to it. I've just got the 10 days staring me square in the eyes, and, and uh, I'll face the future when I come to it. Are your children old enough to understand what's happening to no. you while you'll be away? No, they, they don't. They're much too young for that. Did you tell them anything when you left them this morning? No, I just try to kiss them and, and leave. stands out in your mind. Yes, there was. That time that Soupy Sales was on. You remember that show? Oh, very well, yes. You really do? Yeah, you I want a... more of the same?
All I can say is just thanks, really. It's been uh, so beautiful knowing you, uh, appearing before you. Um, I, uh, I'm going back, I'm back to New York, a lot richer, believe me. And I, I'm not speaking of I money. I guarantee now. it. A lot richer in spirit than uh, when I came here. So thank you very much. Avianca Flight 52 from Bogota, Colombia was supposed to land at Kennedy Airport just before 10 last night. It never made it. Flight 52 crashed in Cove Neck outside of Oyster Bay, turning the quiet suburb into the site of Long Island's worst air disaster. In West Hampton Beach, I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. Mom, you really had to dig to the bottom of the trunk for those pictures. I think you looked adorable. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to an hour with a few very special Pittsburghers. During my 14 years in this city, I conducted hour-long programs alone. Now we are two. My daughter, Roma, who is a TV anchor reporter in New York, and I were asked by WQEX to pose questions to some of Pittsburgh's movers and shakers, and we had a very good time. Or am I putting words in your mouth, Roma? <laughs> Which you have on many occasions, <laughs> but not this time. Uh, yeah. Pittsburgh has held uh, some of the best memories of my yeah. life, yeah. and it was a real thrill to come back. Um, I was reacquainted with some old friends, and that was great, but mostly this time we met new ones. Oh, one of the, one of the new ones that I met was Vincent Sarney, who was chairman of the board and chief executive officer of PPG Industries. Now, normally, corporate executives tend to shy from controversy, but not Sarney. We cannot and should not impose environmental regulations that curtail the economic growth of this country. We also spoke to KDKA's Patty Burns and saw a personal side of Patty, one that I don't think many Pittsburghers know. But during the interview, she made some pretty outspoken remarks, and particularly about her very own field, the media. I think I'm lucky to work in a very competitive market. I travel a lot and watch the other newscasts in other cities, and I am just uh, shocked at some of the things that they and some of the people they put on the air. And then I took what you might call a literal cook's tour of Pittsburgh's restaurants, some of the better Pittsburgh restaurants, with the Post-Gazette's food critic, Mike Kalina, which we'll get to shortly. But a particular highlight of this program was meeting Tito Capo Bianco. He's the Pittsburgh Opera's general director and a, a dynamo, you, you might say, bigger than life. He's considered one of the world's leading opera directors. And so my first question to Tito, what are you doing in Pittsburgh? I love challenge. And when I arrived the opportunity in 1983, friends of mine in Pittsburgh called me. They want to change. They want to go forward. They have a beautiful project called Benedum at that time in process. And I thought that was the moment for me to change after nine years in California, San Diego. I have many friends. I knew many people in Pittsburgh from 1962. Wonderful friends. I know what a wonderful community with a wonderful background yeah. and I can feel that this was a, like a sleeping lion ready to wake up. I've heard about you that you're considered among the, the top five opera directors in the world, yet Pittsburgh is far from being in that echelon. Is it frustrating for you to work in a city like this? It's not frustration at, uh, at all. Because the purpose when I came here, I put 
in second place my ambition of stage director. You see, I was extremely lucky. In a very, very early age, Roma, I went to Berlin, to Holland Festival, to Paris, you know, through New York, San Francisco, doing everything I want. Uh, that means that when I took the chance of Pittsburgh, the challenge of Pittsburgh, was more the general director, the pioneer to build an opera company. Second, the stage director, you know, supporting that project. But my main objective was build a company, you see? I hear you've tripled the endowment, you've doubled the audience attendance. Uh, you must be doing something right. What is it that you're doing? Well, I think what I'm doing is uh, bringing to this community quality. And when you build the product, you know, America will buy, and Pittsburgh is buying the product. That is the secret. You offer a good product, you do, you do the right contact, the right publicity, you know, the right connection, the right marketing, right. and this audience is buying the, the product. You talk about a quality product. Was it not a quality product before you came? Was a different, was a much different. Uh, Pittsburgh had some difficulty 20 years ago for different reasons, was not in, in the proper place than supposed to be artistically for many different reasons. That I mean, was no priority taking care of the arts at that moment in Pittsburgh. I watched a master class that you taught and uh, you have so much passion that you put into your teaching, so much love. Is, is that really you? Do you believe in art without passion? Do you believe opera without passion, theater? I think the art is product of passion. I think for me art does practically doesn't exist. You don't have that passion, that there is that need to give, to project, to get out. You come back to sing only, that's all. You are producing sound only. You lost that. Close your eyes. Feel here. Feel here. Undi felice e te minagari la 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 di la la. I am ready to die. I am ready to die. Yes, I know you hate me. I don't problem. No, I don't hate you. <laughs> <laughs> then, then give me that. Okay. This is that. Start to sing. Give me that. Yes. <laughs> Close your eyes. Close your eyes. What do you want I to do? Wanna, I wanna what do you want to do? Now. I want to go back to the past. Now, I, now. Now, I want him now. Hey, do it. I, do it. I want him now. Do it. Do it. Do it. Okay. Go. 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 Do it. Tell him. You love him? You love him? Yes, I do. Tell him. I love you. Tell. How much? I love you very much. No, no, with that hands like that. No, like that. No, like that. I love you very much. Can you embrace him? <laughs> embrace him, yes. Cry a little bit. Cry, cry a little bit. Cry a little bit. Come on. Feel I it. I want to stay with you here. I don't want to leave. Yeah. Come back, you change, you change. It was beautiful before. 
Put your face there. Put that feeling, that feeling. Keep that, keep that, keep that. And now keep going. The first priority is always, and I hope always will be, the quality of your voice. No doubt, and the technique. But we have to equip the singer with everything possible to carry that voice, to carry that technique, to make them believe that everything you learn through emotion, to your body, to convince them that the vocal cords is not only these two muscle here, your body are the vocal cords. You know, and if you can use that properly, your voice can get better use and you can add to the voice layers of more quality and more passion and more, you can express better yourself. Yeah. The, the, you can add more texture to the quality of the, the, the voice, more deepness, more meaning. Because remember, voice is a sound. You have to add something. There is a, a young man named Peter Sellers who I know has done amazing things in opera, uh, modernizing the old standards, making them avant-garde. What do you think about all that? Well, I am glad that finally a Peter, Peter Sellers in our field, what they resent, and it's 25 years too late, dated. See, we was doing that in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, I was doing that in the 50s with Tosca changing Mussolini times and all that. And exactly, that what brought me to the international view. Do you think Peter Sellers is doing honest work? I've got to ask that to him, I don't know. <laughs> Does it appear honest to you, what you see? I think, I mean, he's doing that because he believes what he's doing, or at least he has fun or entertaining himself, or entertaining people. What, and I hope that people watching that, people with get better idea about opera, what be, opera is supposed to be. The danger is if you don't explain to them what Peter Seller is doing with opera, then people believe that that is opera and that was supposed to be. Mm and change the values. And I think that is not honest. That is not proper. You see, that, I think that we have to, the clear we speak in a front end, the better. I'm sorry? The clear we are to each other in a front end explanation, the better for us. Mm -hmm. you know? What about the Benetton? I mean, how does an old movie theater, and an old, really, a vaudeville house, really work as an opera house? Well, the Benito is, I think, probably the best opera house acoustical in town. I mean, in town, in the United States. Wow. It's, the acoustic is unbelievable. You know, I remember uh, right after the opening of the new opera house in Houston, they came because they knew about our Benedum Center. And they were extremely jealous, and I don't know how many, over $100 million, $120 million they spent in a new opera house, and we have much better acoustic than Houston. You mean to say this beats the Metropolitan Opera yes. House? Yes, acoustically, yes. When a Pavarotti stands out on that stage at the Benetton Center, does he really sound better than in New York? Yeah, you know what he asked me when Pavarotti came here the first time? Tito, where are the speakers? He said, there are no speakers here. Oh, come on. To be, to be too, too good to be true, he said. It's true. He sent another tenor on stage and was rehearsing here, he went up to be sure. At that moment, he believed me. He thought that the stage was Mike. So when they step out on that stage, they sound better at yes. the Benetton? Oh, yes, you can hear them when... better than the Met. No doubt, better than Chicago and better than San Francisco. We have better acoustic than Met, Chicago, and City Opera included. That's incredible. You, uh, Pittsburgh can be extremely proud of the Benetton. You're the general director of the Pittsburgh Opera. I guess that means you're a businessman, an artist. Is there a hustler in you as well? Yes. What's most important? You, have, you need a touch of madness. And that's you too? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is it difficult? I don't know because I am like that. It is probably difficult. I love what I am doing. I love it. I cannot tell you that it's difficult. I know I have to be every day ready you know, and with uncertainty, then I never know what can be tomorrow. Never. I have no assurance. Mm -hmm. Here are not. 
in Europe with the government support and... And here know, where you don't have it. You know, but I love it. You know, it's said that if you want something done, give it to a busy person. I think this is especially true of Vincent Sarney, who is chairman of the board of PPG Industries, as well as its chief executive officer. Sarney is also chairman of the board of the Pittsburgh Opera and the Allegheny Conference. He is a director of the Pittsburgh Pirates and a member of the board of the Guild for the Blind. But busy as he is, Sarney found the time to take us on a tour of the PPG facility in Harmerville, where we saw some new and innovative ways to use glass. Marie, we'll have to put on our uh, safety glasses here. This is our research okay. lab. Uh huh. What happens here? Uh, this, this is, this the, is uh, Har the Harmerville. Harmerville Glass Research Lab. Uh -huh. And here we do all of the research for our glass business. We would do research in automotive, aircraft, housing, residential, and we have about 300 professionals that work here. Marie, we're entering a lab now where we have a display of surface seal coated glass. Now, this is a very interesting development. Uh, this is a, represents a windshield, not coated and coated with our surface seal. And you see the difference in the water as it hits the windshield. Let me show you what happens to that windshield when we are driving our car and we have wind on the windshield. Yeah. Now you see, this is a, an aircraft windshield and it has a non-coated and a coated side. Now I'm applying a little bit of wind that yeah. you would get from motion and you see the difference. Look at the non-coated, you can hardly see through it as and the coated of course is very clear. So this, this development uh, will go on aircraft in 92, and we would expect it to go in the automotive industry in 1994. Let's move on. I have another uh, development I'd like you to see. I'd love to see it. As you see, here is a deeply tinted glass. Now, this is plain glass, and we'll uh, affect an electric charge, put a little electricity to it, and watch it change in terms of tinting. That will happen rapidly. Within 30, 45 seconds, you will see this glass approach that tin. And as far as the driver of the car is concerned, what does this mean? Well, it means a number of things. First, the car will be more comfortable in that less infrared will be transmitted the, into the car. It won't be as hot. Won't be as hot. The air conditioner will work more effectively because it won't have as much heat to get out of the car. So the comfort level of passengers will be increased. And it less energy. And less energy will be used overall because of that uh, heat load reduction. Marie, here we have an exciting development that I'd like you to see. This is our heads-up display. And what that is, is in the windshield of this automobile, when you turn the key on, you yeah. will see all the instrumentation that normally is found in the dash of oh, a car. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, there's a speedometer right on the windshield. Correct. An tachometer, tachometer and a gas gauge, and all the gauges that normally are found in the panel the dash of a car. Th this is not uh, distracting when you're driving? Well, actually, you get accustomed to it very much and, and is uh, less distracting than if you were looking for the same information from the ordinary dash on an automobile. I can't wait for this one. Well, this should be here in, uh, in two to four years. We would expect to see it on automobiles, and it's a great uh, improvement. It's an exciting development, I think. Later, I met with Sarni at PPG Place. We talked about the fact that these are not the best of times for the image of the corporate executive. I talk about that because I know that the image that they have is uh, not a good one of uh, executives and of industry in general, but I think that it's not accurate. 
the vast majority of our people. You, you remember that we have 35,000 people in this company. When you talk about a company, you're not talking about bricks and mortar. You're talking about people. And uh, to assume that because uh, a, an executive that you read about is representative of these 35,000 people, that can't be right. Most of the people in our company, and I believe in all companies, want to do what's right by themselves, by the company, by the community in which they live. And so we have uh, bad examples in all areas of life. Unfortunately, what's, uh, what the media uh, really uh, uh, takes a lot of time with are the bad examples. You're up here on the, the 40th floor, and you have a magnificent view of the area. Do you ever get a proprietary feeling about it all? Do you, do you feel, this is all mine? <laughs> no, hardly. It, the, the feeling you get is that uh, it's great to be a part of it and uh, to have the opportunity from time to time to help make it a better place for all of our people to live. That's the feeling I get when I look out. You're a director on the board of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Is this a long-time interest? Are you a baseball fan? Oh, I, I love baseball, but uh, the way we come by that is community involvement again. Uh, uh, five years ago, the Pirates were on the verge of leaving Pittsburgh. And uh, a group of uh, companies uh, joined uh, together to keep the Pirates in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. because we feel that uh, Pittsburgh needs a major league baseball team uh, to enhance its uh, quality of life. Well, I understand that the Pirates had their best season, the last one, yes. and yet they lost $7 million. If they lose $7 million on their best season, what does this mean for the future? Well, I, I unfortunately, uh, I see the, uh, the future as being uh, bleak uh, unless there's some change in the way baseball is operated. The reason we lost uh, money, and uh, we will continue to lose money, is because we don't have the revenue to support a competitive baseball team. Uh, we don't have the revenue because the bulk of the revenue comes from television and radio, and this is a small market. And so we don't compete with uh, Chicago, New York, uh, Los Angeles, and so forth. And as a result, we still have to pay competitive wages to our ball players if we're going to field a competitive club. Are they getting too much, those players? Well, I, I wouldn't say that uh, the players themselves are getting too much because they're working in a competitive environment. I, I can't see a ball player saying, look, I'm willing to take a million dollars a year less just to play in Pittsburgh. That doesn't make any sense. But what I am uh, concerned about, and again, this gets back to, uh, to what's happening throughout the country, uh, is the, uh, the standard that's applied that would pay someone to play baseball $5 million a year. There's something wrong with that when we, uh, we can't pay uh, a person to, uh, who, who works at some skill uh, 50000 a year. There's just something wrong with that scale. We, our sense of values has been skewed terribly. You're chairman of the board of the uh, Pittsburgh Opera. Does this interest relate to your heritage, your being of Italian extraction? Absolutely. Uh, I started my days uh, uh, as far back as I can remember on Saturday listening to opera on Texaco's uh, program Saturday afternoon. So, uh, and uh, my father would uh, sing arias right along with Caruso. So opera has always been a part of my family and uh, I've been pleased that I've been able to help in a small way here with Pittsburgh Opera. You really love all this, don't you? Well, this is our community. And uh, I think that it can be an example for a lot of communities. You know, there wasn't so long ago that we were being written off as a community that had died because of what happened to our industry. Uh, our people have shown that it's people that make a community. No, it's true, Roma, what Vincent Sarney says about the people of Pittsburgh. I remember when I was doing my show, my one-hour show at KDKA, invariably when I had guests from out of town, they would always comment on the city itself. They didn't know it was like this. And the people, they said, they were so warm and friendly, which well, is true. But mom, you know, it's not even a matter of opinion anymore. It's actually official. That's right. I and mean, I remember reading uh, in, a, in a newspaper sitting in New York City that Pittsburgh was voted or considered the number one, the, the most right. livable city in the entire country. Uh -huh. Remember that? That was just a few years ago. So it is mm -hmm. official. But right. you know, one thing, I wasn't surprised about that, because I know Pittsburgh is a great place. Other people were, but not me. 
um, at least outside uh, of yeah. Pittsburgh. But one thing I have to admit I was uh, pretty surprised about is the restaurant scene in Pittsburgh. There's some terrific restaurants. Lots of them now. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't remember all that many good restaurants. I don't have a memory they of weren't. food in Pittsburgh right. except some of the terrific ethnic um, items, yeah. Uh, delights. Yeah. But uh, I had the treat of going on, sort of eating my way through some of Pittsburgh's better restaurants with the help of Mike Kalina, who we already mentioned, um, well, has done a lot of things. He's uh, the, the food critic for the Post-Gazette. Yeah. I must say, Mom, the guy is a one-man food machine. He's got, well, look, he's, he just recently uh, published this, this book. Uh, what do they call it? Mike Kalina's Travel and Gourmet Cookbook. Mm -hmm. And he's also got his own uh, public uh, television series. So he's, uh, he, he knows his yeah. stuff. He's and, very uh, enthusiastic about food, too, I notice. He is. He's very enthusiastic. Well, yeah. and, and that, uh, that translated in, yeah. in our tour, as you're going to see. It was what you might call a, a culinary trip down memory lane. Mike, you know, when you talk about Pittsburgh restaurants, the granddaddy of them all, as I remember, was the Park Shed. That was really special. No longer in business, unfortunately. I can't believe it. Nino's, great Italian food. Also a goner. <laughs> also a goner. All right, all right. Weinstein's in Squirrel Hill, great deli food. What happened to that? No longer in existence, all unfortunately. Right. I can't believe this. You cannot tell me that my favorite deli on Walnut Street, the gazebo, is not there anymore. Please. Yes, I think I can, unfortunately, but I have bad news and good news. The bad news is it's no longer here. However, the good news is it's now a wonderful Chinese restaurant known as China Palace. Why don't we go inside for a taste? You know, one of the most surprising things about the restaurant revolution in, Pits Thank Thank you. You. in Pittsburgh is the fact that there are now actually more Asian restaurants than there are Italian. Boy, have we come a long way. I remember growing up in, in Mount Lebanon, there was only one Chinese restaurant. All they served was sweet and sour pork and egg rolls. Mushu pork was gourmet for them. And look at this presentation. Incredible. You know, that's another thing that the Asian restaurants are doing. They're taking more concern now, not only about the ambiance. This is a beautiful place, as you can see. But look at the way the food is presented. I mean, it's you don't know whether to frame it or eat it, you know? And what we're about to enjoy here is uh, a lobster dish in which the diced meat of the lobster, from this guy right here, I assume, <laughs> is sauteed with some black mushrooms and a brown sauce with a little bit of peas. peas. And vegetables. Uh, and over here we have a triple delight, I believe they call it, in a straw basket. It's sort of a pastiche of, of scallop, sea scallop shrimp, vegetables, and some chicken. It's like a flower. It's so pretty. And it's, you know, the basket is also edible. Yeah, you know, or you could take it home and put, uh, you know, some condiments yeah, in it, it or whatever. it looks like wicker. Now, how does Pittsburgh compare to other big cities in terms of its restaurants. We've scenes. come a long way. I mean, we're up there with cities uh, like Cincinnati, which is a great restaurant town, and, and Dallas and Houston. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not in the New York or San Francisco category, but 10 years ago, we were on the lower end of the spectrum, and we are now on our way to becoming a great restaurant town. It's amazing. I never really thought it was going to happen, you know, mm -hmm. when I first started as food critic back in 1978, so it's been a very big surprise. Well, let me ask you, what's been the most surprising part about dealing with restaurants in Pittsburgh. Without question, the most dramatic surprise is the transformation of the South Side of all places into a restaurant hub, would you believe? We've been talking to Chef Red Rayner at Cafe Allegro on the south side of Pittsburgh, and uh, he's prepared a terrific menu for us. Why don't you tell us what you have here? All right, well, I have the Belgium endive salad here with grilled radicchio, and we drizzle it with a little walnut and lemon uh, oil dressing. And here we have a grilled pheasant uh, mm. from Ligonier with a raspberry red wine sauce and preserved fruit. And this is one of our signature dishes, and that's pasta del sol with cream, sun-dried tomatoes, and a little chicken stock. Yeah, I remember growing up uh, in Pittsburgh and you go to an Italian restaurant and you got those thick, heavy red sauces. Do you remember the that? The quality of the restaurant was how thick the tomato sauce was, you know. <laughs> how long the, it boiled Exactly. In the they simmered it for a month. They thought it was a great sauce. But this, you probably whipped up that marinara sauce and maybe less than enough. Really? Five minutes, yeah. You know, Mike, you're not the only one who knows his way around a Pittsburgh restaurant. Now it's my turn to show you something. 
Mike, I'm going to show you how I spent a whole summer during high school one year growing up when I was living in Pittsburgh making the famous fried zucchini at F. Tambellini's on 7th Street here in downtown Pittsburgh. And to help me show you how to make this great delicacy is the famous chef Angelo Pellegrini. Angelo, you have to let me do this because I'm reliving my youth now. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in? Okay. You take a slice of a zucchini. Look how thin it is. Mm -hmm. Very nice and thin. It's already been salted and sweated so that the liquid drains out of it. Mm -hmm. And then you stick no. it first in the... the flour first. Oh, okay. I forget these things. It's mm -hmm. bad memory. It's been mm -hmm. a little while. Mm -hmm. All right. And you dredge it in the flour no, like so. You wash. And then you put it in the... This is the egg wash. Water. What's in milk, there? Milk, egg wash, uh, water. And milk, uh -huh. salt and pepper, parsley. Salt, parsley, garlic? Mm -hmm. A little bit you of garlic. You can't do this without garlic, right? right. Okay, and then no, you're back in the flour. And you stick it in. Mm -hmm. Not too much room. Should I put it on this side? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just like that. Here we are, the final step. You pour out this delicious stuff. And you can't leave out the lemon. The lemon is crucial. Sprinkle some lemon over it. Can't wait to taste Mike. this. Big Chef, are you going to try some of this too? Yes. See how she did. So good. <laughs> how did I do, Chef? Very you good. To be honest. Excellent. Very, Very good. good. That's what I do. You think I have a Every future day. here? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Uncle Mike. Bene. Thank you so much for a delicious day. Pleasure That's with great. all mine. It was great. Patty Burns, as you've never seen her, coming up next. One of our goals in putting together this program was to show KDK Television's Patty Burns in her home environment. And it's a very lovely environment. She likes flowers, and they're all over the house. The, uh, the decorations themselves, that, well, all together, they look like a, just a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Mm -hmm. Didn't it seem so to you? Very tastefully decorated home. Mm. And, and I must say, quite a switch from what people are, are used to seeing, uh, the environment that Patty is normally in, which, of course, is that very cold, a yeah. uh, relatively cold yeah. news setting. And I think, you know, having done the interview in Patty's home, she was able to open up quite a bit and, and, and she be was, more comfortable and candid mm, with us. She really was, was very open. There, was, there wasn't, as you know, there wasn't one question that she tried to avoid or, or did she say, I don't want to discuss that. We even talked about uh, when you are on television with your mother or father, how do you address <laughs> them? And, and, and at first she, people said, well, Patty's not going to call her father dad. What else could she call him? Gee, I don't know, Mom. What, <laughs> what else could you call your, your father or your mother on television? It's no, true. it's just, it, it just would seem very strange to, to say something other than Mom or Dad. Anyway, when, when I came to Pittsburgh in 1962, Patty Burns was in high school, and mm -hmm. we talked yeah, about those good. times. Patty, do you remember the first time we talked about uh, TV career? I do remember that. I was still in high school, and you were kind enough to have me come over to your house, and you were so encouraging. Right. There were not too many women in the business to talk to. At that time, no. But then, I remember that, that time when um, there were a couple of stations in Pittsburgh vying for your services. And I do remember uh, one of them was WTAE. And, uh, and of course, KDKA wanted you to work at the station. But not until they heard that WTAE wanted right, me. Right, right, right. But you were also concerned, too, at the time that working closely with your, your father, that, um, well, that there'd be too much identification uh, you know, being together like that, working that closely. And that concerned you at the time. Mm -hmm. But you wanted to do it on your own. Did, did you ever have any regrets about having made that decision at KDKA? Nope, not one regret. Uh, Dad and I talked, as you know, before I did sign with KDKA, and we knew that there would be some backlash about my being Bill's daughter, and he, Dad right. got me the job. But at, at that time, I didn't mind them saying that Dad got me the job. I felt, if just give me time to prove myself, and you can say whatever you want now. It's all right. And if Dad was willing to take the chance and say, come on board with us, if he was willing to stick his neck out, I surely wasn't going to disappoint him. And I was more worried about shining for him rather than Westinghouse management because he did stick his neck out, and I think that's what parents have to uh, realize. And it was, it was great fun working with him and learning from him and from you. What was it like that 
first day starting at KDKA. Oh, Bill scared. Burns daughter. Oh, I scared to death. And you ran into people that didn't speak to you at the station because they just didn't like the idea and they thought it was nepotism. And then other people really bent over backwards. Your father still calls you, doesn't he? To give you oh, some sure. criticism. I see him every day for lunch. He broke his hip, so he's not as mobile. So I, he lives right next door to the station. And I run lunch. I call it meals on foot. And we <laughs> joke about it, but it gives us a nice chance to visit every day. But do you ever get upset about his criticism? Yeah, I get mad because he'll catch me and I'll just ooh, gnash my teeth thinking, why didn't I catch that before he did? And he'll say, Patty, that's North Huntington Township. That's in Westmoreland, not Allegheny County. <laughs> and you spell it such and such and such. Ah. And I'll just, I won't even know I've done it, but he picks up on it immediately. Well, is this, is this tough, though? I mean, to, to every time you're delivering a story, are you thinking, Dad is watching, and he's going to, he's going to say, that's wrong, or that's, you know. I'm so used to it now, Marie, that it, I think it, initially it was a tremendous strain. But yet, it made you strive for perfection, which is what everybody should do in this business, mm -hmm. or in any business that they go into, I would hope. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great incentive for me to double check my facts and make sure it was all right. And still he catch me on things, and does today. Have you ever thought about going beyond Pittsburgh to, you know, the hub, the, the New York market, Big Apple? No, I really never have, Roma, because this city has been very good to me. I have friends, uh, Faith Daniels, who went to New York, but she was unhappy here. They told her she wasn't going to anchor. Mike Schneider left this market. Mm -hmm. He wanted to stay. He was told he couldn't anchor. Long and Cannon had the slots filled up. That's never happened to me where I wasn't doing what I wanted to do, or we met, reached some sort of agreement as to what I would do at KDKA. So why leave when I've been made very happy here, and this is my city, where my family and all my friends are, mm -hmm. to go to a New York or an LA and be thrown into the, the bowl with a, all, the, all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. But then, are you saying then, Patty, that as far as your future is concerned, as far as your career is concerned, this is it, you have, you have reached your future. If I could stay future, here the rest of my life, I would be really? very content to do so, really? yes. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the, there is an invasion of privacy when you do your work before the public. Uh, and mm -hmm. having worked with your father as long as I did, uh, he always gave a you know, very friendly, friendly appearance, but there is, there is a very strong sense of privacy that he maintains. Mm -hmm. I think you're a chip of the old block there, too. Do you appreciate your privacy? Oh, I love my privacy. But doesn't it bother you that um, you know, people like to know about you, and inquire into your love life, and so <laughs> forth? Doesn't that bother I'm you? I'm always astounded because it's so boring. I can't imagine anybody wanting to know about me. Uh, what, your love life or you? <laughs> what? Just period. I'm a boring person. Uh, I'm always amazed that people are interested. I'm always flattered. Uh, I do, on weekends, I just am very low-key. I don't wear makeup. I don't do my hair. I wear my jogging clothes and try to be mm -hmm. as inconspicuous as possible. Mm -hmm. But it's always nice, and people still recognize you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't go anywhere in Pittsburgh without someone stopping, and weren't you always flattered when they did? Oh, very much so. But you see, I came from a different environment from, from the newspaper field, where we had complete anonymity, even though the and picture... And she ate it up when she was here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I really enjoyed Marie it. Marie Torrey, she'd <laughs> smile and pose. A picture? Sure. <gasps> look, anytime. Look, he wants my autograph. <laughs> It was wonderful. This is a sort of a standard question, but I, I'm always curious to hear from people. Your highs and your lows in television. My highs and my lows, hmm. Well, you have certain big star names pop in at the time I met the Pope. I mean, that was really a, a big deal to me. John when I was Paul? in Rome. Mm -hmm. The second? And we didn't know, when, even when we were flying over, we were going to get the interview and get him. And then when we did, I mean, that was really a, there's no greater feeling than calling back saying, Rome calling, we got him. We, and got he, we didn't have to say who he was. We got him. Uh, that was really uh, a high. Uh, Lowe's, I think uh, Lowe was when Dad retired. I really didn't want him to retire. Why? Well, for several reasons. I, we were doing the noon together, and we were chugging along just fine, having a lot of fun doing that. And I think that uh, his exposure on our air was good for the station, too. He was a tremendous, and still is a tremendous asset to KDK. But how did it change for you, though, once he left? Well, I was on my own, and those ratings could have gone And who do they look at first when the ratings take a nosedive? The anchor. Right. Patty. Right. <laughs> yeah. So every day I was saying, oh, please, God, let them still be out there. Let them still watch. And I was uh, lucky the uh, ratings stayed stable. We've heard so much, Patty, over the years, uh, of course, about your father. He's been so, so visible and so dominant in this area. We never hear about your mother. 
Well, every time I'm off the air, I'm usually with Mother. She moved to Naples, Florida, oh boy, about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So now I have a wonderful place to stay, and it's a great area. And I talk to her every day. We're very close. Yeah. Does she advise you Does, as far as career is concerned? Or, or well, she was... never professionally. I mean, I would ask, should I take this or do this or blah, blah, blah. She's like, always been a great sounding board that daughters always need, as I'm sure, Roma, you have been to Roma. That, Mom, what should I do about this? You need someone who's going to give you an honest answer. Mm -hmm. And that's what she's always been. That, Does she mm -hmm. critique you at all? Does she tell you you were good today, you are bad yesterday? Well, she doesn't see it from day to day because of... But I mean, Only before she, she comes out here. Oh, she's so thrilled. No, I mean, she just thinks I'm perfect. <laughs> did, did, did I can you? relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> as I'm sure your mother thinks you are. Well, Absolutely. Yeah. Is she I perfect, hunger Marie? For well, Yes, she is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, there are times I'm objective. I'm, I'm not. Not often. No. Everything I do, she loves. And I guess that's what mothers, mothers are supposed well. to do. I, I don't know if I could take it if she was hard on me. But you know, isn't that didn't. everyone needs someone to boost them? They need a mom or a dad to say, boy, you look good today. That was great. It's true. Because who else is going to tell if you? If they don't, right. Who else? Because you have been successful at what you've been doing here, that, that uh, there is a tendency on the part of the public to say, oh, boy, she's lucky. She just had it made. It, you know, <laughs> she's, she must lead a wonderful, glamorous, fun-filled fun oh, yeah. life and so forth. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they, if they say that. They don't say it to my face. No, but they, you are aware they do say it. I, well, if you tell me they do. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I like going out on stories, and I like working at KDK, and I like the city. So it doesn't matter. I and mean, people are going to say did horrible things anyway. But Dad always outside. said the thing to worry about is when they stop saying things <laughs> about you. But, but outside of that, I, I remember uh, after my husband Hal died, um, and suddenly I was functioning here as a single woman. It was a whole different thing. Um, I, you, you know, we talk about TV being male dominated, but it's a it's a male-oriented town. It was then, anyway. I think Pittsburgh is a very, very much a couple's city, absolutely. Uh, very conservative in that manner. But I think it's changed from, from your experience in that there are more women, more single women, more women postponing marriage, so that it's not the, the, the sore thumb anymore. I go to dinner parties un, unescorted after a newscast or, or whatever, or I'll go to a social function. I prefer doing that than dragging some poor man along with me who's going to have a dreadful evening mm -hmm. and have to listen, sit and listen to a bunch of boring speakers. But I am committed to, to doing those things and going. So I like bustling in and bustling out actually by myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you mentioned boring some man, but how about when you're bored by a man only because, well, you, you're, he's with you only because you have to have an escort, <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether it, yeah, he's interesting or not. I hated that part of it. And I can remember at one point of uh, deciding it was better to spend New Year's Eve by myself than to spend it with someone who bored me. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I agree. I was at peace with myself on that. Mm-hmm. And that's why people say, well, why aren't you married? I want, what? I want to say, what, misery loves company? I mean, what's, what is it? <laughs> I have, if the right, again, if the right time and the right place and the right person, sure, I think people, I'm not doing this to make a statement. I'm not staying single to make a statement. It just isn't right for me. And I have seen so many broken marriages and so many ugly marriages and people just sweating it out. I don't want to get into that and hate my life. I would rather be alone, as you said, on a New Year's Eve or any day of the week than be in misery with somebody and having to put up with that person. I just couldn't do it. There's never been one that you thought would be wonderful to be married to? Well, um, someone laughed and said, it, your dad wouldn't approve of someone unless, even if Jesus Christ came back as a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there has, my job has always come first, and I have a lot of good friends. He's very dominant in your life, isn't he, your father? Oh, sure, he has. He always has been. Mm -hmm. You said that the job always comes first is, is that until you meet the right person, or was, or? Uh, I think I will. I would always, always like be. to work. I've I've been independent this long. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I'm not one of those you know old maids they talk about that get so used to being alone that they don't ever want to marry. I don't. But I'm independent, and I like making my own money, and I like my own freedom. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to have to ask someone, "Excuse me, honey, I need a pair of shoes. Can I have twenty dollars?" If you had to give advice to someone such as Roma as to um, you know, how to do it while there is um, a parent who has been in the business, very much a part of the business, 
uh, looking over their shoulder. <laughs> what, what, what would you say to her? I would say, listen to your mother and take her advice because every time I would ignore my father's, well, I ended up regretting it and I hated it if he'd ever find out that I'd screwed up because he had told me one thing and I went ahead and, you will make mistakes. I made a lot of them. Mm. Um, but so learn from my mistakes. They know, they know, trust me. And I'd always say, oh, well, he's older. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and then right, come... they've been out of it for a while or, or whatever. I, I'm curious to know what kind of advice he gave you. Well, really, he, he gave me the same advice your mother gave me. Stick to the basics. Mm -hmm. Learn to write and to report. And to, don't specialize. Be able to do it all. Be able to write all sorts of stories and about all sorts of people and all sorts of events. Be yourself. Right. There was and there was one <laughs> and other listen. thing. Listen. Well, there was one other thing. I think you did remember because you you exemplified. I was never lose your femininity. That's right. You did tell me that, and you told me another thing. You said, for God's sake, maybe you didn't say that, but you said, listen to the answer when you ask a question, because mm -hmm. so many people will ask a question and be so involved with their next question <laughs> that they're going to ask, they don't even listen to the answer. Right. True. That's so true. And the best interviews are when you can follow up on an answer and it gives you a, a, another idea or whatever. But some people just go out and they have five questions they're going to ask come hell or high water. You said before you were concerned about you know, being able to, to uh, reach your potential. Do you feel you have reached it? Oh, I think that as a reporter or as an anchor, every day is a challenge. That you think you could have done better perhaps if you'd had more time or better interviews or whatever. I don't think you ever feel you've reached your potential. You know, Mom, I think that's a philosophy that you believe in. And in fact, I don't think you've ever stopped seeking new challenges. No, I'm still doing it. But I really do believe that once you stop trying, well, that's it. There's no purpose in life unless you are constantly trying. And well, anyway, I know that um, you feel as I do about this this wonderful hour. It's uh, it's always the well good times to be in Pittsburgh, and uh, we have both felt this and. We thank you so very much for being with us this evening, and let's try and do it soon again, huh? Good night. Our studio setting was designed and furnished by Ed Linder and Associates, 701 Yonker Street in McKees Rocks. Accommodations for Marie and Roma Torrey were provided by the Holiday Inn at University Center, 100 Lytton Avenue in the heart of Oakland. This program was brought to you in part by Westinghouse Electric Corporation and its over 100,000 employees worldwide, dedicated to quality and excellence by the Grand Concourse Restaurant in Station Square, where an Edwardian railroad station was reborn and now serves the tri-state area as an elegant, fine dining experience. And by the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation, a nonprofit historic preservation group serving Allegheny County. Each year, thousands of members, Pittsburghers, and tourists participate in landmarks tours, lectures, educational workshops, and historic preservation projects.